Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody's flight was uh, enjoyable. Um, so we'll kick off today. Uh, building a virtualization appliance for three BSD, Beehive, and OpenZMS. I don't think that one's up. That's good. You think? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm the ICT security lead for community, uh, Latrobe Community Health Service. Uh, we're a uh, uh, not government organisation, not for profit um, health services uh, service in Gippsland, Australia. So it's in Victoria, right down the bottom. Um, we were just a small organisation with uh, about 400 staff and um, uh, eight offices. Um, around a small part of Gippsland, uh, but uh, we have grown. So I'm just going to go through a brief introduction about us and myself, um, and then I'm going to hit the background of how this came about, um, the problem that we were challenged with, move into a conceptual stage of how we built the appliance, uh, moving to production, and then as all products should be, the reiteration and ongoing maintenance. So about me, um, I've been in the ICT field for 26 years, came out of high school, um, self-taught. Uh, so basically I landed in the era of pre-Windows 95, where Macs ruled, Alpha ruled, um, and uh, we were a, well I started off with PC support, but then I eventually found my, my uh, calling in, in Unix. Uh, once I started getting into some uh, Solaris and Linux, and then, and then I got introduced to OpenBSD in 2000 when I was uh, working out of Hong Kong um, on a B2B, B2B project there. Um, a Canadian colleague came up and said, hey, try this. Um, you guys probably don't know him. So. <laughs> um, and uh, I've gone, wow, this is good. This is just you know lightweight, where Linux was getting fatter and fatter. No, there was no system D then. But, um, it was getting fatter and fatter, but um, OpenBSD just did what it needed to do. Um, um, and now I'm an advocate for the BSDs, so um, every BSD is different, which is good. It should not be just a single BSD where you, uh, you know, a single point where, like you had with Heartbleed, you know, SSL was a uh, open SSL, SSL was a disaster, and um, you know, now we've seen forks of that. So the BSDs have that, and that's why I'm that good. Like, you know, if OpenBSD does a good job, firewall routing, we'll use that. If we need a storage appliance, we'll use FreeBSD. If ZFS, we'll use that. You know, it's it's the right tool for the right job. Um, and then, yes, I do have a life outside of computers. Um, uh, I was previously into road racing. Now I do off endurance gravel riding because um, I'm getting older, and uh, it's now about being smart rather than being fast. <laughs> um, so about us. Um, we were originally a Gippsland-based NFP NGO um, with eight offices, as I said, um, but now we've grown to 900 plus users um, across the state of Victoria. So we have now 51 sites across Victoria, so we've gone for 51, um, which covers a land mass of 230 square kilometers, uh, 230,000 square kilometers, which is the size of Laos in Asia or Minnesota in the West. So it gives you an idea of how big our footprint is um, from a maintenance perspective. So, you know, all those updates, it's like you've got to make sure that they work right or it's a bit of a drive because our trains and planes don't work too well. Um, and um, our values um, or our mission statement for the organisation is better health, better lifestyles and strong communities for our, for, for our clients. Um, background, in the first half of 2016, we won a contract uh, with uh, the Australian government. It was a, um, that came about in the, in the 2000s and then it progressed and it was to provide the National, uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme. So it's a, um, sort of like the NHS um, or the Canadian Health System, but it's for disability. So it's, it's to provide um, uh, programs and funding for, for participants um, to be able to meet their needs and goals in the community. Um, so in mid-2016 um, was our first rollout of uh, uh, sites. So 
first all, we had two, two, two small sites. Well, one was a bigger site. It was about 60 people that were going to be working out of that site, and the other one had about five people. Um, so we had to deploy some infrastructure. We didn't know what was, what was ahead. We had no idea of how big this was, this was going to grow or where we would end up where we are today. However, it sort of gave us the ability to try things to see what would work and what wouldn't work. Um, so we hooked up with a, a 10, 10 megabit um, MPLS connection, not big, but you know, internet in Australia is expensive, um, which gave us uh, connectivity back into our um, uh, like hub and spoke topology of our, net, our core network. Um, also saw uh, the rollout of obviously switching, so we use L layer three switch gear and an ESXi host running Windows Server 2016 for, for um, printing services. That just gave us the ability to, um, you know, put something else on there if we needed to, or spin up another Windows server or something like that. We were not uh, too concerned um, at the time to be going down the virtualization path that wasn't even on the radar at that particular point in time. Um, so as the staff numbers grew, we, we sort of hit a bit of a roadblock because the tablets that we got given by the government to do work on their portal, so each tablet has a VPN client and connects back to the Australian government's VPN gateway, um, it started generating a lot of traffic. They push out up the Windows updates and that sort of stuff over that and the 1010 connection back into our core network and then our, our VSD firewall um, wasn't big enough for this. So I had to come up with an idea of how to deliver uh, more capacity without increasing costs because as I said that MPLS 1010 connection that costs us in the region of $1,500 Australian which is about I suppose 1200 US dollars um, a month so it wasn't cheap so the idea was we sat down I sat down with my manager while we were at the site well, it was actually dinner time we sat there and um, had a couple of beers and I thought how about if we take that VLAN that all those are on and offload it straight out to the internet. So I came up with a concept. We ordered a cheap internet connection. Um, the National Broadband Network was being rolled out in Australia at the time um, and this was at Ballarat which was a fibre to the premises um, uh, site. So we had access to 140 and we could buy that at about 150 Australian dollars, so a tenth of the cost, but 10 times the capacity. So um, basically, um, a guest, an OpenBSD guest was added to the SXI host, um, so the appropriate networking and that sort of stuff, and then I was able to drop that out to an internet connection that was dirt cheap, so it was basically just pass out that specific traffic, which was 443, to a specific IP address, which is the government gateway, and problem solved. Um, no capacity constraints, we could monitor it and that sort of stuff. And it gave us a good indication of when you've got this many people on site, how much bandwidth we, we're going to need, because nobody could give us any figures at that point in time what we needed. So we were sort of flying blind of what we needed. Um, so that's generates the problem. So we had to take stock from those lessons learned as I sort of detail um, there before you. Uh, we needed to uh, come up with a reproducible device, um, something that was we could maintain and then we could roll out multiple of that had a reasonable licensing model, which ASXI clearly didn't. Um, it, was, it was costly. Uh, I mean, obviously, we get a, a reasonable rate from uh, VMware in regards to that, but it was not, it wasn't okay with me because um, the product that we had was really limited in what you could do. So just think of the developer edition of, of, of VSXI. Um, so we needed our devices also to be durable. Uh, well, one of the other sites in this region, which is called the Central Highlands region, which is uh, out Ballarat Way, so between Bendigo, uh, the Bendigo is for the Australian viewers, is the Bendigo was the boundary up there, and then there was um, uh, Geelong, which is south, so Ballarat sits in the middle. Um, 
one of the bit further out west, the premises that we had there, uh, the rack was in a broom closet with um, you know, cleaning products and mops and stuff like that. And there was no ventilation, there was no window, there was nothing. So it was basically just this hot room of dust and smells. So we had to make sure that uh, uh, any sort of device that we were going to roll was going to be able to operate in harsh conditions. Uh, I had a limited budget to work with, so uh, that meant that you know where I could save money um, on the software costs meant that you know we could spend a little bit more on more reliable hardware. Um, and the key here was phase two of the NDIS rollout. So uh, in total, we've had three phases of NDIS three. No, yeah, three phases of the NDIS rollout. Um, so it was already under negotiation, so I had to come up with a solution quickly because the next one was going to be huge. So the concept. So we started off with um, Beehive uh, just because um, I already had it in testing and it was working extremely well. Uh, OpenBSD worked on it with Grub's Beehive and um, Windows 2016 basically the UEFI support came on online at the right time. So uh, that, that hit the mark, we were, we were off to the races. Basically, we had, we had a hypervisor ready to go. Um, Beehive and FreeBSD was also chosen because of the uh, liberal, liberal light and BSD license. We, you know, we could do what we wanted. We could make the, we could make the appliance, customize the appliance, do what we needed to do, and then you know, it also helped by anything that we've we found, and even to this day, we we find find things, and you know, it gets reported back to the projects, and then um, you know, patches get made. So you know, uh, while BSD means that we can take it and then just leave it totally in house, um, nobody progresses from there. Uh, but at least we had the option. Whereas you know, if you go down the GPL path, you're stuck. You've got to commit back. Um, another key component why FreeBSD was chosen was ZFS. Um, I come from a time where Veritas Volume Manager was the uh, king of the fleet, and uh, you know he rolled out every Sun server that he worked on for a client. Was basically had Veritas Volume Manager licenses attached to it, and you would roll that out. That gave you an ultra reliable file system and Volume Manager. And Volume Manager is key there. Um, it means you have better control over your guest disks. And you also have other other key components like snapshotting, which is um, uh, crucial for running a a uh, hypervisor uh, where you want to update guests at any point in time. So Open ZFS uh, rules the fleet there. The other thing was FreeBSD was simplistic, so it was not only just being lightweight, which made us be able to create a Type Two. Well, in my in my mind was creating a type one hypervisor because all it did was be a hypervisor. Um, the fact that there's no system D or any of the other kludge that seems to be building up in some of these other operating systems now um, was not gonna play a part. So we knew that the, the, the key component, the hypervisor was going to be ultra reliable and it had a small footprint. Uh, the device that we're looking at, we were looking at uh, from a storage perspective what's going to last for five years because these things are going to get racked and left for five years base they are going to get maintained remotely via software but the actual hardware was going to be um, uh, left in place so we chose ssd and you know that in itself for enterprise ssd is not cheap so um, you know we had to get err on the side of smaller so that then led us to the hardware discovery phase where I went out to market to see what the market had. Basically, Lenovo had nothing. IAC system had something um, and Supermicro had something, basically the same, same unit. Um, the only problem we had there was management weren't, weren't too keen to deal with someone that wasn't present in Australia, especially from a support perspective. So. Um, whereas Supermicro does have a distributor in Australia. So we ended up um, going with the Supermicro product um, and we really had no issues with that. 
So that's what it ended up. So yeah, we get brocade switches out to each site. So it's just the standard layer two switch, VLAN with about five VLANs, I think, from the top, from the top of my head. Um, and that's basically your trunk with the high lead, VLANs going over into your host, and then the other component there goes out to your, your internet mode of choice. So either your premises, which might be an NTD or a VDSL mode or an ADSL, even an ADSL mode. Some places have got ADSL, which the uplink really suck. So, sorry for the slang. <laughs> um, and if anything's actually confusing, just yell out and say, what did you mean by this? Because I will talk and then I'll forget. Um, we'll have two ADSL ports set up, so then that way we can actually use our domains within OpenBSD and then drop out certain VLANs to different um, uh, internet connections. So, the Super Micro Server was a uh, 5019A FTN4, which is an atom based server. So, it has eight cores, no, yeah, eight cores, one thread per core. Um, not obviously, uh, over, overly fast. So, we, you know, we weren't too concerned about speed, even running a Windows server um, guest because all it was doing is print services anyway. So once it was fired up, it was fine. Uh, but the fans in it, there was not really much of a cooling issue. So the fans we could assume would get clogged up and stop working. And we knew that the actual unit would keep going. Uh, what it provided was four one gig ethernet ports. Uh, you know, we needed a minimum of two on the spec. Um, however, we're glad we went with four. So always go err on the side of caution because those sites that we couldn't get um, VDSL or fiber, we ended up able to use two ADSL ports and order two services in for that. Um, and the device was low powered, so it meant that we didn't have to have chunky UPSs to run these devices. Storage was two 240 gig and Intel Enterprise SSDs um, using uh, OpenZFS in a mirrored configuration. Uh, that meant that, you know, we could burn one out, wear one out, the other one would be in place, rinse and repeat, scrub, resilver, you're ready to rock and roll again. Um, and we used OpenZFS uh, for those drives. So basically there's only the two drives in the mirror configuration. There's no extended drives, there's no external storage or anything like that. It's all just one self-contained unit. And the first iteration saw FreeBSD 11.0. Um, there was a few issues that we had, I'll go into them shortly, but um, the free BSD was selected because it's easy to maintain and report bugs. I had several contacts through Michael to, um, to throw things through. Uh, then I got to meet Peter Green and um, uh, then basically you know, two Aussies talking about footy and drinking beer and uh, was able to sort of, you know, continue that, you know, issue where I'd flag an issue or, you know, a certain thing that was that was griping me because we had to build these devices so end users like our admin team could maintain those. We didn't want to have something that was only able to be maintained by one particular person. Uh, going down that path, I've been there before, it just, you know, you end up, you know, having to deal with, um, you know, support stuff when you want to be having a break and on holiday, so I want to be able to come away to conferences and not have to have people <laughs> ring me. <laughs> Um, patch support, so we didn't actually go for a custom build of FreeBSD, generic kernel, generic everything. That meant that we could then utilize the, the FreeBSD frameworks for uh, patching and upgrades uh, very simply and using the resources that the project provides. Um, we used UFI support, so OpenBSD was booted through Grub2Beehive and uh, Windows Server 2016 boots perfectly, the ISO and the operating system boot perfectly using the UFI framework. And FreeBSD 11 was selected because of its long-term support. So I can't emphasize this enough. It's businesses look for long-term support when it comes to software because a lot of this stuff gets deployed and we just want to be able to patch in place. We've got other projects that need to be looked at and that sort of stuff. Once we've developed a product and rolled it out in the field, we want to do minimal um, 
uh, R&D to uplift to a, a new major version. And the guest management on the concept was Chives, which was a fork of IOHive. Did I get it right? Yeah, IOHive. Um, IOHive was, was good, but it needed a fair bit of work and it was, it was stalled. Chives was a fork of that and um, they'd done a fair bit of work. However, I did find a bit of kludge, which um, I'll talk about in problems in the concept. So the guests saw OpenBSD 6.1. That was a really good release. Um, it was the one prior to Carl. Uh, Carl did cause a few issues for us down the track, uh, but we did sort, well, it has been, so Anton sort, sorted that out with uh, improving the scripts. Uh, so, <laughs> what was that? In, with Carl. Um, when you're booting an Atom server, they boot very slow. And when you're doing relinking, the relinking would be happening in the background, syspatch could blat it, or the user could reboot it, and then all of a sudden the relink hasn't completed, the kernel isn't done, then all of a sudden you've bricked your guest. Yeah, and when- Let's get sorted out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was, it was a bit, I, I did submit a patch um, uh, to the man page for, I think it was soft dev. Um, but soft dev wasn't the cause, soft dev was just a thing that when I disabled soft depth, it seemed to alleviate the particular problem or it became more evident and it didn't actually black stuff too much. Um, but Theo said I was going down the wrong path, which is fine because I wasn't, I didn't know what I was looking at. I was basically just trying to solve a problem once, once Carl got ro rolled because uh, yeah, that was a 10 hour drive. <laughs> um, so yeah, 6.1 using Grub, Grub Beehive and uh, Server 2016 using UEFI. So the networking component. So how we configured networking here, as I, as I talked about, um, all the networking was done and VLANing was done in the host operating system at the free BSD level. Um, guests should always be past adapters and not have to be, con not have to concern be concerned about VLANs because um, you don't want guests sitting there sniffing traffic that they shouldn't be at. They shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to look at. So by putting uh, tap interfaces into the guest as uh, third IO net, um, interfaces means that they get that interface for the VLAN that they're allowed to have access to. Um, so the main port was the IGB zero. That was the trunking port uh, where all the VLANs were trunked on and the secondary port um, or tertiary port, uh, ports uh, IGB one and two um, were bridged. So they weren't VLAN off or anything like that. They were just bridged directly to an adapter that was then presented to the guest, which was OpenBSD. Uh, that allowed any um, ISP related stuff. So uh, some of our connections use DHCP to the ISP, others will use uh, PPPoE. So, um, by having that bridge meant that the OpenBSD guest could do the authentication or DHCP request uh, to get its IP to con continue its connection. Um, open ZFS, so each guest had its own Z file for storage. Uh, that allowed for snapshots prior to upgrade, which is great. Um, nothing like being able to go snap OpenBSD, BSDRD, and then does it all work? Yes. Does it not work? That's fine. Just roll back and um, and then work out what went wrong. Uh, basically, we had a lab set up with the same infrastructure, so we haven't had to roll back like that. Um, our tests uh, have always been successful, but you know, there's always the case that something might not work, and at least we've got that uh, uh, feature. However, our lab equipment always keeps a Windows Server 2016 image up to date. So we just keep that rolling and keep the updates happening. Doing a ZFS snapshot, sending it to the uh, mirror server internally, and then that way we can just pull that straight image straight down when we've got to do a new build and we don't have to sit there waiting for an Atom server to do um, Windows updates. Windows updates are slow on an Atom server, at like a day for a major. Um, and then the uh, ports packages that were installed, no modification to any of these, they were basically all just dropped on there, except for chives. So chives, we had to hack three files 
um, to be able to, because they used uh, version numbering. If you look at the boot sequence on an OpenBSD install, uh, the actual um, reference to a directory number to call BSDRD, uh, it changes per version. And that was hard coded into Chive, so I had to do a hack um, in the library files to get it to boot whatever version that was still using at a particular time. So that brings us to a standard configuration in rc.conf in FreeBSD. Um, what's there is basically what we use. Um, there is other components that uh, I've left out because they're standard when you do a FreeBSD install, so there's no point in explaining them. Uh, but this is how we basically configured up the VLANs on the particular host um, that then were able to be used as bridges um, into the adapters that were presented to the guests. So, oh, <laughs> cool. Um, guest installation. So OpenBSD was installed individually, not from a master image. That meant we could then have uh, IGV2 keys all um, individualized and SSH keys. Um, and if you've ever done an OpenBSD install, it's like all of 30 seconds and that's if you, if you um, slow. Um, the Windows Server 2016 was uh, installed from a maintained image. So uh, an image that we cut that hadn't been activated. Uh, all we do is just keep it updated. And then once we've installed it, then we activate based on the um, UUID that's on the actual uh, uh, virtualization um, startup config file. So yeah, this is how we, we just pump it straight from our mirror server, straight to a Z bowl, ready to rock and roll. Um, so we got the installation down to four minutes. Slowest bit's actually the network <laughs> moving the image. So um, uh, even ZFS on atom-based servers is fast. So that's sort of something to take into consideration. So these are the problems as I was sort of um, mentioning previously. Um, Chives um, couldn't handle group priority when you use something, two different bootloaders. So using UEFI and Grub2, um, yeah, priority just goes out the door, doesn't work. And I found this out um, uh, 1159 before BSD can in 2017 and went to my manager and gone, I've got to fly out tomorrow. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I took stock, had an hour, because I had to get six devices out the door before I left, and um, basically used that hack, dirty hack RC local to bring up each VM individually, and then just use sleep between, sleeps between the <laughs> devices. Yeah, dirty, ugly, achieved, achieved what it needed to do, and those devices were out there for six months before I even come back to them. Um, the hacking of the library scripts, as I was talking about, uh, it was a bit of a pain, but there was nothing I could really do. Um, and I wasn't prepared to sort of invest too much time in chives because I knew that that was not going to be sustainable long term. So um, we just left it as that. Um, and also chives used a, a really complex uh, set of uh, file locations for where the um, images for the host were stored, even the configuration files had their own um, data set, which was like, you know, why well, have a data set for a couple of kilobytes of files? You know, I really couldn't sort of fathom that. And when you do the ZFS list, it was damn ugly. So yeah, that was a, that was a bit of a showstopper for us too. Um, the boot methods. So having two boot methods for starting guests was overly complex. We decided, uh, you know, that's not sustainable either. Uh, and Grub to Beehive was was not something that our team was used to support. So uh, they'd have to learn command line interfaces and understand consoles and serial consoles in Unix. And I wasn't prepared to go down that path of teaching them that or, write, or writing the applicable documentation. So. Um, UEFI is what we needed to do, or CBIOS if that was ever going to be available. So um, 
which are still not available, but UEFI seems to be working well for you that works with um, OpenBSD, um, having GPT and UEFI support native now. Um, so that's, we're, we're fine. We've got our needs met. Um, and the UEFI bootloader uh, imports at the time brought in so much stuff that we didn't need on the hypervisor. So it brought in GCC and all sorts of ugly stuff that, yeah, really shouldn't have been part of the uh, the uh, bootloader package, but that's all been fixed now. So um, enjoy the bootloaders. I've done a patch, which I'll talk about later um, uh, for UEFI, which fixes uh, a few OpenBSD issues. Um, so FreeBSD, we did have problems there. Um, so 11.0, threw a few issues in with the network stack. So we actually had to turn off TX, TXM, uh, TSO6, TSO4, and LRO, which was a bit of a pain because that really hurt performance for the guests. Not that you know our links were big enough to really worry about it, but you know that meant more load on the actual kernel and then into the hypervisor, um, the, you know, impacting hypervisor performance where it could have been offloaded to the, networks, uh, the network card itself. And uh, initially, we had to um, lock down cores and threads, so then that way if we ran other operating systems, like say Windows 10, um, that has a licensing issue if you um, have uh, more, like present two, CP, two physical CPUs to it. Um, so by striking it down and saying, okay, I want four, um, vCPUs, you're not going to, you know, Windows 10 is going to then have, you know, basically four threads rather than um, trying to be presented for physical CPUs. So then we moved to production. So these problems were not a showstopper. We go, okay, we've got a few problems, but we've got around them. We've got, you know, we've we've sorted out the network stack in FreeBSD, we've got the loot loaders sorted. We did the appropriate hacks we needed to. Right, we're good, we're good. So um, went to the boss and said, yeah, you know, we've got 90% uh, usability, so the team can sort of manage this, but we've got 100% uh, functionality. We've got what we had with ESXi. We're ready to move forwards. So um, management were committed. They go, right, that's good. You've got the product, let's go. So. Um, the project got named 0.5, and there's been successive um, point series since then. We've got a now 0.3, which is just a small little device that open will manage switch and to do some funky VLAN stuff, and and um, means we can use just a Lenovo for a site that's got two or three people, um, just a little Lenovo think station because it has this big dual fiber all power and um, does exactly what the bigger unit does, um, but on a smaller scale. So we had the management commitment, we went ahead and uh, purchased inventory for the 1.0 rollout, and we decided to come back and reassess um, our tooling uh, uh, as things improved within the community and, and more, more things happened around um, uh, Chives, if Chives was going to be uh, what we decided to continue on. At that time we had no idea, but you know, as with any product, you should reiterate and renew so, version one saw a pallet of 25 units turn up uh, of the 5019 FTN4 from Supermicro. Um, ran FreeBSD 11, and basically everything that came out of the concept uh, got rolled in. So the appliances was uh, appliances were spun up and shipped for install. So we um, initially had because we had to go. Fast, we had an outsourced contractor would just go in and actually plug these things in the rack and then set them up for us. We had a install guide that they'd follow. As long as they plugged the ports in the right places, the devices would come up. I'd see them back at head office. I could just complete the install and then away we go. Um, so we had no issues on the initial deployment. Everything that went out in the field worked. Um, Free BSD update, fetch, and install around the Beehive guests was. Um, not problematic at all. It basically worked. We could then, you know, um, the OpenBSD guest was the last 
thing that would stay up because some of these guests were set um, uh, as being a router. So that was the interface. You didn't actually have access to free bits. You had to come in through the guest to manage the hypervisor. So um, it was it was good to see that FreeBSD update updated everything, including Beehive and everything around it. And then once we were good to go, um, shut down ISR, give me two minutes, go and go into the OpenBSD uh, guest, shut that down now, sit there, wait four minutes, bang, it's all back up and running again. So um, it, uh, it was easy to maintain. That's why we're still on the 11 tree now. Um, even the, VM, the initial VMware ESXi host that we used for the proof of concept of how we wanted to sort of create this appliance, um, we swapped that out because we'll have one thing in this field that's different to everything else. We wanted just one thing to maintain. So ESXi gone, Beehive native, that was it. Um, so this is a example of what we put in the documentation for our, our contractors. Um, so they could um, cable up correctly, but it gives you an indication of how we actually configured things. So um, the printers were on a different VLAN, um, video conferencing was on a different VLAN, the wireless access points had multiple VLANs, as you'd expect with Cisco access points. Um, and then they were all trunked into there, which the OpenBSD guest had you know, multiple interfaces and managed all the traffic that went to and from uh, different VLANs and controlled it. Uh, we don't have any performance issues with that. However, um, in uh, high performance um, tests, we are seeing some um, issues with performance of the VertIO net um, driver in, in OpenBSD. So hopefully more work in the lock area of OpenBSD and the network stack will improve that performance. But when you compare, um, say, a FreeBSD guest, a Dragonfly BSD guest, an OpenBSD guest, the uh, VertIO net stuff um, is, is low in the performance area in the same, when you're providing the same hardware um, from a virtual, virtual point of view. So, you know, we'll get uh, 700 meg, megabits per second out of uh, Dragonfly. As a guest, we'll get about six on FreeBSD and about 350 um, in OpenBSD. However, that's sufficient for our, our production, but I needed to see you know, where our ceilings, if we've got, if we go expand further than how much, how long have we got before we start hitting that ceiling. Um, so then you see the green line moves out to the ISP. So that device there is any generic device that might be what our ISP needs to, to connect. Uh, that can be, you know, a five bits per premises NTD or a VDSL modem, ADSL modem, and then uh, the all the traffic's VLAN. Is it unique uh, or maybe anybody who might know? Do you know does the host side VertIO network interface and Beehive do most of the work? I do not know. I never asked. Because that would probably be the right direction to head. But that would probably be logical. Okay. At least in the guest side, because of interrupted mapping and stuff. Because yeah. we have to do all the three long ones each year. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I said, we we haven't got there yet, but at least you know we're already looking down the path of the future and, and what we need to sort of take into consideration when we have to go from a performance point of view. I'm so happy with this device that. You know, we're even looking at swapping our firewalls out with this. So, um, it, it is that that good? Um, our firewalls it is still, you know, we've, our main firewall is only a hundred hundred connection. Um, so we're not going to hit the limits there by using that device in place as well. At the moment, it's bare metal hardware running OpenBSD, um, but it from a from a, a maintenance point of view, I want. I love the snapshots, I love the features of snapshots because then it makes easy rollback. Um, so then moves us on to reiteration. So, you know, faster hardware uh, required where environmental conditions allowed. So the Atom servers, uh, you know, we had a few complaints from a couple in the admin team 
that uh, maintaining the Windows Server or doing stuff on the Windows Server was slow. I could understand that, but I then also argued back. I said, how often are you logged into there to do the work? Eh, not often. I go, well, you know. Um, so, you know, we did look, look um, for something else. Uh, and then we also wanted to get rid of multiple bootloaders. We wanted to go all to UEFI, all in. Um, that also meant that we could then look at a more simplistic management for administrators. So we have some administrators that are versed in um, manage, managing the VM and changing the configuration of VM. And then we have other administrators that can then deal with the um, ZFS file system. So they can increase volumes as they need fit, uh, see fit. So when we rolled these out, they were just basically 30 gig images. But with Windows Server and patching, it's blown out. So, you know, they'll just move, to, move between all the servers and increase the volumes to 50 gig and then reboot the server, snap out the, um, the NTFS file system, and they're away off the races with um, 50 gig volumes. Um, there's also addressing the VNC console issues with uh, Beehive UFI and OpenBSD. So, um, with managing an old UEFI environment brought into play a graphics stack um, to, to administer. So basically all our administrators could then use uh, a simple tool like um, type VNC, tiny VNC, whatever, whatever your flavor to um, manage the host so they could see it come up from, from boot and then you know, uh, have access to pull all Windows Windows kits up a stink and then needs some fixing, they can do that through the graphics of the post. Um, OpenBSD would, um, when it would go from the bootloader and then turn to kernel, the kernel phase, it would then go, what's the maximum resolution does this UEFI have? And it would just pop. And then it would blow off the screen and people go, well, oh, what's it saying down here? And it's like, yeah, you know, when you're ministering servers, you just want to have a small console and just leave it like that. Um, I'll get to how we fix that uh, shortly, but um, and then continue using the other tools that we worked with, um, that we had, uh, continue using those because they were, they worked for us. So um, we use ZX for, and uh, ZSnap2, which was perfect for um, maintaining snapshots, rolling snapshots back, or transferring snapshots from a back to a backup perspective. Um, because basically we take all the images from all the guests and they just go back to a central mirror server. So if we need to redeploy, we can just take those recent images back out. Nobody knows any different. And that's, you know, our OpenBSD versions are just, they were when they snapped. And same with our Windows versions. So version two, Saurus uh, adopt the uh, Supermicro uh, 5019 SML which is a Xeon based server. Um, still, still the same amount of RAM. Oh, RAM was 16 gigs. So that's all we use for these clients. We don't see, because they're only running basically two guests, um, there was no need to have any more than that. Yeah. Windows Server 2016 actually runs all right in four gig of RAM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and OpenBSD, I just give it a, a gig of RAM. Of course, um, I'll go more in my the talk on, on Sunday, but um, the OpenBSD guest, each guest runs root D, uh, which is how our um, uh, routing table for all sites, so all sites know about each other and traffic can move between them. And you know, that fits perfectly you know, in there, and it would still have room. So um, I think it's about 250 meg operational that, that each, OpenBSD guest has, but that includes the full routing table. And there's no summaries in our routing table, so um, it has the stuff, a lot of stuff in there. Um, we bought 11 units. Uh, it saw us deploy FreeBSD 11.1, and at the time, halfway through the deployment of the units, uh, saw us go to 11.2. Um, we didn't see any measurable differences between 11.1 and 11.2. It's just 11.1 was gonna go out of support three months after two came out. So we decided to just roll two. Um, we moved from um, chives 
to VMB Hive. VMB Hive made everything simplistic. The data sets were simplistic, the configuration was simplistic, and booting, powering up, shutting down, maintaining VMs was ultra simplistic with VMB Hive. Uh, there's been some different work done, and I'm hoping uh, 1.3 can come out shortly because it actually fixes the OpenBSD boot issue. So I wrote a how-to article on um, how to use uh, VMB Hive to boot OpenBSD to do an install uh, because you have to boot the install64.fs file because the ISO doesn't have the shims for UEFI booting. So had to do a bit of an ugly hack in the VMB Hive config but um, it achieved what we needed to do to, to boot the installer up. So basically, add a second disk, it goes, I can't boot the first disk, boot the second disk, and away it goes. So um, that's been fixed in, in 1.3 that, he, that um, the maintainer has sitting in his tree. So uh, it'll be good to um, get that into production. Um, it saw us then be able to deliver Windows Server 2016 and OpenBSD in complete UFI mode. So for our console, same console, two different port numbers, sweet. Um, and two different versions. So we had um, a version of that with two 240 gig SSDs um, for remote sites. However, um, for some of our bigger sites, we've where we want to do some uh, Windows patching on local machines and that sort of stuff, I have a cache server. We built a, um, with spinning Rust, uh, with two six terabyte um, drives, that gave us the ability to then make big Windows VMs. So, you know, you have your standard 50 gig hard disk um, for C drive, and then you have another Z bowl for D drive, which would have, you know, a terabyte Z bowl attached to it. and um, Windows could go and put its, uh, uh, what's the, the new version of WSUS, I don't know what it is. I'm not a Windows admin, but I'll leave that to the Windows admin guys. I just give them the tools that they need and the way they go. Um, so yeah, that gave us um, two products, a thing guest and a volume storage guest. Um, so yeah, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, FAQ, there's a few questions I've been asked over the time. And so they're the questions and they're the answers. So even if there was support issues with VSXI, why did we choose VHive? So VMware ESXi caused random crashing on OpenBSD guests. Um, so I'll sort of pause there. Um, what I mean by that is that how VMware seems to handle its memory management, uh, if an OpenBSD is very concise and and it's really good because it highlights some issues that you may have effective in either uh, physical hardware or virtual uh, platforms. And ESXi would show up these issues around when using IP2 and IP comp as part of IP2. Um, you would all of a sudden get the debugger. <laughs> you come in one morning, you, your knock's gone nuts, and it's like, oh yeah, what's broke? Oh, I know what's going on, yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, uh, yeah. That's why we chose to move away from ESXi. Um, the other part is we would also experience um, when we do a change on the uh, routing table, or if we bought a few sites online at the same time, or our ISP had an issue in their network, and then half our sites could drop away overnight because I'm doing maintenance, that's fine, we, we allow for that. Um, but then all the routes would reappear in the network again and the ingestion of, of um, RIP D uh, would make ESXi fall over or open BSD in ESXi. However, we did not experience and have not experienced that particular issue in Beehive. So, you know, big win there for Beehive. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and even Beehive's, you know, some of our, issue, our, our ones out there have had little or no maintenance and those and I mean that from the host OS OpenBSD has been updated um, if it's internet facing however the um, uh, the get the, the host hasn't been updated but the, uh, the beehive has just 
stood the test of time, you know, even in some of its older forms, like some of the new ones, new pa new patches that come in 11.1, 11.2. Um, you know, uh, we haven't needed those specific things because it's been so stable in 11.0. Um, the next question was, uh, why was VMB Hive used? So, um, changing from Chives to VMB Hive, it basically, as I say, that out of the box, it worked faultlessly. Like there's been a few additions that have come along that have fixed some of the things. Like I've gone to the point where I've just about to provide a patch and the work's been done. I haven't had to worry about it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's some work that's in 1.3 that uh, detects if it's a, if the header on the ISO or the FS has the UEFI bootloader stuff and will appropriately put AHCI HD or CD depending on um, the type of file it is. Um, and are we planning to uplift the appliance to FreeBSD 12? No. Okay, um, so FreeBSD 12, no LTS support. While there is LTS still labeled on the device, if you look at the support um, the term in FreeBSD on the FreeBSD website, um, FreeBSD 11 branch will exceed the support lifecycle of FreeBSD 12. So we'll have reassess it at FreeBSD 13, um, but at this present point in time, unless the scale gets pushed out um, that's currently listed, uh, there is no plans to go to FreeBSD 12. Um, in our testing, we discovered enough breakage to make us very nervous about going to FreeBSD 12. And if the support lifecycle is shortened and we have to wait for 12.1 because that's where a lot of the stuff has been fixed that we did this discover that was broken, um, the effort and engineering required to move to 12 is just not worth it. I'd rather just skip that and go to 13. Um, so the conclusion. Uh, so basically, while it meets the business need and solved our problems, it exceeded our expectations. So the product itself has been you know, faultless. It's done exactly what we will need it and, and achieved the scope that was given to us by management. Um, even though it's technically term, uh, uh, termed as a type two hypervisor, um, we consider the, the device to be a type one hypervisor purely because that's all the device does. And if you look under the hood of VMware ESXi, VMware is technically a type two as well. So um, they class it as a type one, we're classing our product as a type one. I mean, it's really just semantics these days. If you want to get down to it, like IBM did it better and blah, blah, blah. Um, the other reason, the other thing that I'd like to conclude with is the rock solid reliability of the device um, in all the very hot, dusty broom closets that these things are set in, uh, it's been faultless. It's the only time I've had to do a run is because, you know, something's bought for guest and that's it. The actual um, host has been bulletproof. Um, Beehive is compatible with a wide, wide range of guests um, which, where UEFI supports. So Dragonfly um, also works. I haven't tried NetBSD. Uh, just because of time. Uh, uh, so yeah, if you've got a UFI um, supported operating system, give it a go. It's fast and flexible um, on the horizon. Uh, so there's some stuff that I'm sort of working with with a couple of devs at the moment with uh, NVMe support, uh, which could increase the performance of this and um, I have got a, a concept or an idea for a project um, to do a bigger scale. So using bigger hardware to, to do this. So to run alongside our main ESXi cluster. So it's a few things that I'm sort of working on there. Um, but yeah, the NVMe uh, presentation of storage where you could then use backing of RAM on a host uh, could see some um, really fast uh, database transactions. So uh, it's something we've got a few database bottlenecks um, in the organization where 
I'd like to sort of start experimenting and thinking outside the square and seeing what we can deliver. Um, because, yeah, we do use virtualization a lot. Um, oh, there was one other thing, the patch that I was talking about um, with um, the UEFI bootloader. Um, so the, it was around the expansion of when OpenBSD boots and goes from the bootloader to um, the kernel and it would use maximum screen resolution. Um, patch basically fixes that by constraining itself to the size that you actually dictate to the B height parameters when you're feeding it in. So um, now um, uh, Spleen works, this font works perfectly. Um, it stays in the constraint box. So if you say, you know, we only want 800 by 600, it's only a console to make sure it comes up and we have to patience with. But everything works perfectly. So it goes from bootloader, the fonts are correct there, into the into the actual kernel, the fonts all print properly and it's all fast. It's not like, it just, it works well. So um, I'd like to thank the developers there for uh, helping out and, and going down the path of working through a different um, uh, UEFI loader. Uh, those patches have been applied to the um, GitHub tree that we um, pull ports and packages for the bit. So hopefully that hits mainstream uh, when the next uh, latest run is run and is pulled. So yeah, that fixed that and that moves to thanks. So I'd like to thank the following projects for v uh, the FreeBSD project. Thank you very much uh, to the project and the foundation for continuing support of v -Hive. Now it is so ingrained in our organisation, you know, I have a vested interest in, in making sure that uh, advocacy works well and that, uh, you know, we keep the focus on that and uh, keep, keep progressing it. It's, it's got the foundations now, now it can be improved and made better. I'd like to thank Michael Baxter, thank you uh, for your encouragement back in 2014 um, in getting or starting to play around with this and uh, now it's turned into fruition and thank you for organising this event. Uh, Peter Green, uh, one of the lead developers that started with on uh, Beehive, uh, got behind the scenes um, in the early times when I've been trying to get this up and running. Uh, he's, he's been helpful in sort of, I'd have an issue, he'd see the issue, he'd go, oh, I can understand that, he'd provide a patch or work on it or give me advice on, on uh, where I needed to go uh, to sort this out. Rodney Grimes, um, he's been a, uh, a, a good addition to the project and very level-headed and, and comes from an era where I worked in and understands you know, some of the things that you know, us old folks tend to uh, you know, gnaw away at. And I also would like to thank everyone else, um, developers here, that work tirelessly on open source software. Because without you guys, we wouldn't have the tools that we've got now. And you do either as part of your day job or you do it as interest or you do it out of love it. And uh, you know, uh, I and a lot of other people um, really respect that and thank you. How can you help donate? So um, continue Beehive um, development. Um, please donate to the FreeBSD Foundation. And that leads us into questions and answers. How, how was, um, were you, uh, uh, in terms of Medicare and ADI and things like that, were you uh, had to go about certifying the stack or um, uh, just in terms of the boxes for screens and things like that? Yeah, no, so we didn't, this, this didn't have to come under the ASD requirements. Right. So ASD is the Australian Signals Directorate, which was previously the Defence Signals Directorate. And that is the, um, the security document that uh, all government organisations have to abide by. Um, now, the end user tablets that have been used by the NDIS are um, controlled and managed by the government. So and they set up endpoints. So there's no uh, split tunneling on the VPN, yeah. and they make all connections and do all web calls through that VPN. So we have no control over those tablets, right. and 
so the network doesn't require to be made because those tablets can go out to the internet, and which they do as part of the government departments, they can go out and then connect back in with VPN, that sort of stuff. So, um, so it didn't, there was no requirement to have our, our um, network or VPN uh, certified. Is it like, and, and then I just fix my my other stuff. So uh, you touched on how you handle um, the so you use snapshots and things to handle the Windows Server updates. Yeah. Okay, that, that's what. Um, and the only other other one was um, uh, I I guess just just in terms of just public perception. So did you? Early on, I guess this is more speaking from a, from experience as well. But have any kind of issue around having to reinstall the cell? I get you kind of addressed it at the end in terms of uh, you know the big wigs or people who are saying, "Oh, you want to use this VPN? Then either I've never heard of it or or manifest what is this, etc." So I know just from my without getting too much detail, but I um, we've been dealing with a couple of health providers and and I, they want to run Windows Server, and I said, "Oh, great, run ZFS with VTube because they have these." Horrible HP volume systems that do things like if that MVP object is on file, they'll just copy a file with a couple of kilobytes of changes. The file might be a gig in size. I said, put that on ZFS VTube and on, on VHB and then run the whole stuff on V1 and you'll be fine. And they see that phrase, and I guess because it doesn't have Amazon or it doesn't have ESXi, they blanch and then yeah. just say, I don't want to touch it. Yeah. But was that, it sounds like that wasn't so much an issue for you. Was it? Yeah, it's because um, we went down a conceptual stage yeah. and um, we have to work in the budget constraints. So we look for anything that's going to give us an advantage because um, from a financial point of view, we have to make sure we spend our money correctly because we're transparent and we get audited by the government and being a, uh, a not-for-profit organisation, uh, as you're well aware in Australia, the, you come under audit and all sorts oh, of yeah, financial, financial re regulatory requirements. So um, no, it didn't have, it wasn't hard to sell it because we already had OpenBSD running the environment for, oh, I think, you know, 18 months beforehand and it's been rock solid. Okay. So um, the BSD word was already there mm -hmm. and it was just required to show how you can make an appliance out of this and you know have confidence in it. And if you have confidence in being able to talk about a product mm -hmm. and you're very knowledgeable in it, then you have the ability to sell it. And that was that was key, is just being able to, you know, be confident in the product, sell the product. Um, yeah, that's how we sold it. So we don't use DQ. Right. DQ is yeah, a memory. Yeah, man of memory you probably use. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, in this day and age, um, uh, ZFS using LZ4 mm -hmm. uh, compression with its optimization, uh, where it, because it, it's basically doing a block level just using Z block. Mm -hmm. um, if it can compress it, it will, um, but if it goes for a while before it can't compress it, then it just leaves it uncompressed. Yeah. And with um, FreeBSD 11.1 introducing um, compressed arc, oh, yeah, it yeah, meant yeah. that you know that two gig of because um, uh, we limit our arc to two giga, giga RAM, mm -hmm. um, meant that uh, the you know that might fit three gig of, of arc in there. So Windows loves that. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. It, it then operates more in memory, uh, even though it's SSD backed, mm -hmm. so it's still fast there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, more 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 performance than Maria, especially when it comes to my other CPU. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, cool. Question from the chat room. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Coops asks, what were the major issues faced with 12.0 specific to your use case, and have they been reported or resolved yet? Uh, yes, they have been reported, and yes, they've been sorted and stable. Okay. So um, one of them was uh, IPv6. Um, IPv6 would just, yep, <laughs> just disappear and then all of a sudden I'd say, why is my host gone there? And uh, yeah, IP, IPv6 was busted. Um, another one was the um, Intel EM driver was busted as well. Um, from a point of view where, even though it only affects, um, lap, well, because on my laptop where I'd actually give demonstrations and that sort of stuff, suspend and resume, you suspend it, you resume it, 
would come, if we, if we, the laptop would come back to life, but then you'd lose network connectivity. There's nothing you would do to actually bring your adapter back to life except for reboot. That's been fixed. I think that was an IF lib issue. They got any other questions? No, I'll wrap it up. Thank, Thank you so. all.